it's so good to see everybody here this morning. Y'all could have been anywhere that you wanted to be in the world this morning, but you chose to come to the house of the Lord, and uh, that's a wonderful thing. No better place to be, whether it's in this house or another house down the road, whatever house of worship you choose to go to, as long as you're worshiping the Lord, there's no better, no better place to be. We're going to start things off with a song here. Sing along if you'd like to. Uh, we're missing some folks today. Uh, see here, Byron and Mandy ran off to the islands. No, I'm kidding. Byron had shoulder surgery. Mandy wants to go to the islands. Uh, my son's out sick. He, he, I think he got the flu, so Mama's home with him. And uh, so me and Roy are gonna gonna handle the music today. We're gonna we're gonna try to bless y'all with some songs. So since there's less people singing, we need the ones that are here to sing real nice and loud. Just kind of cut loose and let it out, man. That's that's the name of the game in worship. So we're going to do a song here to get things started. Sing along, say hi to your neighbor, make yourself relax, just whatever you need to do to get into the uh, mindset to give thanks and to worship our, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here we go. Glory, 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 I shall not be moved. Hey, good in Jehovah, I shall not be moved. Just like the tree. Planted by the living waters, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like the tree is planted by the living waters, I shall not be moved. In his love abide. truth y'all man it's, it's nice to be here this morning I don't know if we have we have announcements this morning all right y'all Mr. Marvin's gonna come up and give us announcements thank you for that sir how you doing this morning I haven't got a chance to say hi to you yet what's happening bulletin we like those too <laughs> oh well, there's one right there uh, on the other thing I put one there in case the battery ran out on this one should be should be hot ready to go. Test. Yeah. All right. So uh, last week we had our banquet. Uh, we raised twenty one hundred dollars. So we want to really <laughs> thank you guys for that. I mean that's a blessing. We have a concert coming up in uh, Golden. So just be praying about that for us. Uh, April the second. We don't have a time yet, but I'm assuming in the evening. Uh, Tuesday, February twenty second. This Tuesday is our men's Bible study. Uh, come with us. We've been having a great crowd that night. Uh, it's open discussion. Uh, it's really just, you know, it's, it's a blessing to be there. Uh, Byron does a great job. He, he's probably out this week, but I'm sure we have somebody that's taking over. But y'all come see us and, and fellowship with us. We have a great time. Uh, Baby Shire, uh, next Saturday on the 26th for Jazz and Ryan, 2 p.m. So it'll be over here at the Fellowship Hall. So I think that's all of our announcements tonight. Again, I had a bulletin, but that's from last week. So it looked good, though. You know, hey. <laughs> All right. Uh, if y'all would uh, bow your heads with me for the opening prayer, please. Dear Lord Jesus, we're so thankful to get to come to your come to your house, Lord, today, and uh, we come as a, a friend and a child of you, Lord, and we look to you as a father and a provider, a loving father and a loving provider, and we hope that. Hope that we can take the message we hear today, Lord, and uh, the music we hear. Hopefully it fills our heart, Lord, and we can take it out in the world and maybe run into somebody that doesn't know you or that has heard, heard wrong information about you, Lord. Let us be the ones to gently guide that person and tell them the truth about you, Lord, about your saving grace and your eternal love, Lord. We ask that you can make us envoys for you in Christ, Lord, that we can bring others to you and to, for, and, and for your glory, Lord. We ask these things in our living Savior's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
All right, anybody children's going to children's church, y'all can go ahead and head on over. Uh, there should be snacks. I didn't eat them all. I, I thought about it, but, you know, I get in trouble. So y'all head on over there, Miss Sherry, and, and all that's going to have a good time with y'all over there. All right, we're going to do so about four more songs here. If y'all would sing nice and loud. We got a big open room here. It's going to, the sound's going to bounce around. We can fill this place up and have other people driving by on the road say, well, what are those guys doing there? They sound like they're having a great time. Say, well, we are. We're worshiping our Lord. Y'all come on in and join us. Y'all sing nice and loud with us. Once like a bird in prison I dwell, no freedom from my sorrow. I fell. Then Jesus came and he listened to me. Glory to God, he set me free. He set me free, yes, he set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound by Jesus to see. Glory to God, he said. Goodbye to sin and things that confound Not of this world shall turn me around Daily I'm working and I'm praying to Glory to God I'm going through He said note right there. Y'all sound so good this morning. It's such a privilege to get to sing to the Lord and praise and praise him. And uh, uh, the, the, the word tells us that he loves to hear it. He loves to hear his children sing to him. And uh, we sure love to praise him in song. Some glad morning when this life is over I fly Just a few more weary days and then i fly away to a land where joy shall never end. i fly away. won't be long, y'all. Y'all sound so good this morning. Thank y'all for saying I hear you over here, Miss Joyce. I, I hear you. I, I do. It's coming through, right? He told me to keep it up, so. <laughs> Love you, dear. All right.
made the same prodigal return as he did. And all my hope is in Jesus. Thing got me yesterday is it gone? And all my sins. stranger to prisons as I've worn shackles and chains had me all but I've been freed and forgiven I'm not going back and I'll never be the same Amen. Amen. We have y'all sound so nice this morning. So nice this morning. Roy, here's your favorite song. It's a pretty one. I like it too. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk. By your side, I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine, I can only
Can you imagine that day? Imagine what that's going to be like. Too much. Thank you, Michael. For thank you, Michael and Roy, for a music service. Uh, no, I figured I'd do. I, I, I pull a Byron. See, in case it's your first time here, uh, our pastor. Byron, we all know him and love him. He's out. He's getting one of them uh, Terminator robotic shoulders done. That's what he said. I don't know. But anyway, uh, he's, had, he's had surgery, so he's going to be out this week, possibly next week. So he asked me if I would come up with a sermon to preach today. And let me tell you, first off, I'm not a preacher. Don't even. I, we do the music. Me and my wife do the music. And I thought I could sing for 45 minutes. Y'all don't want that, neither do I. But, uh. So um, I said, you know, it'd be, it'd be an honor. It'd be an honor to preach God's word, and uh, I really am the least qualified person in this room to preach on the gospel. But, uh, you know, we're going to give it a shot. Hopefully I'll learn something, you guys will learn something, and we'll leave here with a better understanding and love for Christ. So without further ado, let's get into it. I was looking, praying to God, thinking, searching, what do you want me to talk about today? And I've had a little while to prepare, and I've searched, and I've looked at this topic and that topic, and nothing really stuck. And uh, I come across one, though, that really I've always wondered about, because some of y'all may not know me. Like I said, I used to, I wasn't a Christian until I was like 35 or 36. About that time was when I got called, you could say. Uh, I wasn't a pagan by any means, but I was a traveling musician, and I would go play in bars and clubs and everything that that entails. And I thought, man, them poor Christians, they ain't having no fun. They can't, they can't, have it. They can't do anything they want to. It's just, I feel so bad for them, you know, all stuffy. And... But once he got a hold of me and I started listening to him talking in my head very quietly every once in a while, you know, I've got other plans for you. I don't want to hear it, Lord. I want to do what I want to do. I want my independence. I want my freedom. I want to have fun. This ain't what I want for you. I've got other things I want you to do. And it started working on me over a few years. And when I finally submitted and I, and I came to Christ and I understood what he did and the relationship he wanted to have with me, all the lies that I'd heard, all the preconceptions I had in my head of what a Christian is, what a Christian has to do, all that was blown out of the water. And I realized that there's real freedom in service to Christ now, you take those two, those two uh, words, you don't normally put them together, freedom and submission. Normally, those are two opposite ends of the spectrum because you've got freedom. You've got the, what people call natural freedom where I want to do what I want to do. It's personal freedom. You know, I can make my own decisions, choose my own path, and it usually ends with, that sentence ends with what I want. I'll do what I want. Which, that's human nature. That's how we're born from little babies. You know, you, you got a popsicle and you're holding the baby and the baby's reaching for it. You don't have to tell the baby, here, you want some popsicle? They're going to go for it. They, you know, you got to fight them off. So we're naturally born with a, with a tendency to want to fulfill ourselves more than anything. We want to take care of ourselves more than serve others. But what I found out is that uh, the freedom that you have when you become a Christian, it's the freedom to, uh, the freedom to serve Christ, to serve something bigger than yourself. And when you finally come to Christ and you 
submit, for lack of a better term, to his will, you find out that he has better plans, he has better things for you than you could ever have for yourself. And I didn't realize that. A lot of people I was around didn't realize that. That when you submit, and the word's kind of misleading, but it's really true. You submit, you give yourself over to Christ as a servant in his word. That's when amazing things happen. You become more free than you could ever imagine. You lose the temptations to, to uh, divulge in sins that you realized before you were captive to you couldn't see it at the time you were actually in more bondage when you were quote unquote free than what you are when you're in service of Christ if you think about it think about the 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 times before when when you would uh, be be in sin and how you thought you were happy but then there's a part of you down there just wasn't happy you knew it wasn't right what you're engaged in and then when you came to Christ, he lifted that. That Holy Spirit got inside of you. It lifted that burden off of you. Because he says, you know, come to me, I will make your burdens light. And that's the freedom that sin had denied us for a long time, you know. Uh, in John chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. And he told them, he said, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And we don't see that when we're serving ourselves. We don't see the other side of that. But just like the, the lady at the well that Jesus uh, met there and said, no, you drink this water, you're going to be thirsty again. You serve yourself, you're going to be thirsty again. When you serve me, when you drink my water, you won't ever thirst again. And it's so true. And uh, sin brings the penalty of death. Of course, we know all men were born and we die, and then the judgment. There's no way out of it because our bodies, this flesh, is sin. There's no way to get around it. It wants what it wants. But the good thing is that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to pay for that sin, to stand in our place, to die for us, to make a way back to us. He loved us so much that he gave his only child his life, a spotless, guiltless life, in place of us before we ever even knew him he was thinking of us on that cross it, it's 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 amazing it really is to think and it's a love that as a human i can't understand that you know we can't we can't understand that kind of deep love like that that self-sacrificing we try but we're just not wired to do that that's why we thankfully have a god that is that knew that we would need a savior and he sent Jesus to take our place you know freedom is not the right to do what we want but the ability to is to, the, the ability to do what we ought to do and without Christ we're slaves in sin we're unable to do what's right we can't help ourselves without the power of Christ the Holy Spirit in us you know the Bible says it is it is for freedom that Christ was sent to us stand firm and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. That was in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. You know, Paul wrote to the church warning the church because he knew even as Christians sometimes we could fall back into that habit of sin and be back in that bondage again. We would lose that freedom that Jesus meant to us. Remember we were talking about freedom versus submission? We would lose that freedom of salvation that God had planned for us, you know. God didn't set us free to live in self, you know, self-inflicted bondage. In order to find freedom, we must be alert so that we don't return to captivity. And there's a few ways here that they find in God's, we find in God's commandments to help do that. The first commandment, you should, everybody knows the, the Ten Commandments, hopefully. I'm, I'm still memorizing them. The first commandment, though, that says, you shall have no other gods before me. That sets the tone for the first four commandments. God is inviting you into a relationship with him of mutual love and loyalty. That's what the first commandment is all about. And he wants us to love him as he is, which means that not having any idols in the way, not, not oh, I love God and all, but I got to be sure my cell phone's charged today too. You can charge your cell phone, it's okay. What I'm saying is don't let that cell phone replace a relationship with Christ. Don't let anything replace a relationship, a closeness with your best friend, your father, your caregiver. 
because he loves you. He's going to provide way better things than anything on this planet can. And sometimes when we need a cell phone, he provides a cell phone too. It's kind of cool. Kind of cool how that works out. He, I always told Mandy, I said, I know how God loves me because they made pizza rolls. <laughs> Y'all can tell. I'm not going to hide it. It's, it's there. But I'm just saying is that God loves us and he wants to give us things that make us happy. And the main thing he could give us was his son and salvation. And uh, in society where some political leaders and some religious leaders even want the name of Jesus to be silenced, many Christians are being told to let people embrace God any way they wish. Well, God is God. He doesn't, it's not a different God for you or for you. I'm not getting a different version than y'all are. God is God. He's the same yesterday, like he says, and today and tomorrow. And when he finally breaks that east sky, it's going to be the same God that we've been learning about and reading about our whole lives. It doesn't change. God won't be politically correct. God won't, you know, tiptoe around and not hurt by feelings. His word is the law. And God is God, and he wants us to love him as that God. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life, in John 14, 6. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's pretty self-explanatory. He didn't, he didn't say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, but you can also do this. Or, well, if you, you, know, you can also do this little ritual over here, and that's good too. He didn't say that. He was very clear. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that's just the way it is. There's no, uh, no other way to eternal life, to God's forgiveness, other than having a relationship with Jesus, which is his son. And the first commandment tells us to embrace God unconditionally. The second commandment calls us to embrace him as he is. God is not like a lump of clay that we can shape and change into what we want. He's not a... He's not an a ATM. He, he's not, oh, I, I need something. I'm going to go pray for it today, and God's going to give it to me. And then next day, oh, I need this too. I'm going to pray. God's going to give it to me. doesn't work that way. He, uh, he's a God of love, and it's a very different love than human love. God's love is unconditional, and it is not based on feelings or emotions or how he's feeling in the present moment. He loves us because he is love. That's amazing. Simply amazing. And Jesus came into the world to redeem us, to forgive us, to restore our path back to God. And that's the greatest gift he could give us. If you're pursuing this path, you must first cultivate a love for Christ. There's no way you can be saved and not love the Savior. There's no way to, to get to that point. It's, uh, it's just like if you're a, uh, here's a good example. You go to traffic court, you got a ticket. You go in there and there's a judge sitting up there on the bench. And the judge says, okay, your fine is $5 million. Well, if you're like me, I can't pay that. There's no way I could ever pay that, you know? So what God did was that same thing, this judge gets off the throne, his office bench, walks around to where you're standing there at the defendant's box, takes out his wallet, lays $5,000 on that docket there, goes back up, sits at his throne again, picks up his gavel and says, well, the debt's been paid. You're free to go. That's the same thing in a nutshell of what God did for us with Jesus. Somebody that didn't owe us anything, he paid everything for us. And that's amazing. It's an amazing gift. You know, Jesus came into the world to redeem us. Your ability to triumph over temptation will be dependent on the strength of your love for Christ because just because we're believers and we're saved doesn't think, don't make that think that's going to be an easy life. That actually puts a larger target on you than someone who is not saved, someone who doesn't know Christ. The devil doesn't go after people he's already got. He's not going to cause hard times to people he already owns. But the ones that are following Christ, he's going to turn the screws on you, y'all. He's going to hammer down on you. I've been a, a, a witness of that myself. Didn't really have any problems until I became a Christian and believed. Now, I've had more blessings. I've had better things happen. But I've also had some things that, yeah, I know, I know that's an attack. That's an attack from Satan. That's a spiritual warfare bombardment right there. You learn to recognize those things. Whenever you realize what kind of warfare we're in, 
which is spiritual warfare, not the flesh. There's no monsters under the bed or you know, vampires driving around looking for folks walking by themselves. This is spiritual warfare. This is principalities. This is emotions. This is thoughts in your head. That's what we fight against. That realm is very real. And the fact that, that Christ is there with us in his words and his teachings that give us the things we need to fight and to win the battle. And you can find freedom when you uh, open your heart to forgiveness. Now, this is a real touchy subject for me because I used to be the king of grudges. Man, somebody make me mad? Mm-mm. My little notebook writes you off right there. You know, and I had to change my way because I realized, what if God did that to me? Turnabout's fair play. If I hold grudges and I hold things against people, why wouldn't God look at me and say, hmm, Mike's not forgiving that person for uh, talking about him the other day? Well, we'll just leave all Mike's sins here on the thing. When he gets here, we'll be sure and show him what all he's done wrong in his life. Thank God that God forgives us when we believe. And God, in turn, wants us to forgive others. Forgiveness is one of the most freeing things that you can do because anger it's just like an acid. It only hurts the container it's inside of. I could be mad at Joe Blow over here at a red light he cut in front of me. It's not going to bother him any, but I'm going to sit here and stew for it. A couple of minutes and make my blood pressure rise. And I'm gonna just get, You see what it does. It's eating up the container it's in. It doesn't hurt the object that you're angry at, that you're angry with. It doesn't hurt it at all. But when we, we bear with each other and forgive each other, of grievances, this is what the Lord wants. He says in Colossians 3.13, chapter 3, verse 13, it says, bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Again, that's pretty cut and dried. He's not saying you got to forgive these people. Oh, he did what? Oh, you can't. No, no, don't let that slide. He didn't say that. He said forgive as the Lord forgave you. Now, for me, that was one of the hardest things to get my head around because of my, uh, my hillbilly nature, my upbringing. But I had to learn. I had to pray to God for the strength to be able to do that. And he gives it to you. When you go to him with a problem, he will solve it for you. He will give you the tools. He will give you the tools to handle the things that come towards you. And the thing is, we have to go to God because lots of times we're going to hit situations that we can't handle. You know, I always love, I, you hear folks say it all the time, God will never give you more than what you can handle. Yes, he does. Think about it. If everything that you had in your life hit you, if every situation you had, you covered it. Hey, I handled it. I'm good. What need would you have of God? What need would we have of him? You know, well, thanks a lot, but I got it covered. You know, I'll holler at you next week for that ATM withdrawal. You know, that's not how God works. God sometimes puts things on us so that we will call for him. I know I was, I was several times through the years, and uh, so I also drove 18-wheeler, and there were several times out on that road I'd be in that sleeper at night going to bed thinking, God, I can't do this. I miss my family. I have no idea where I am. I have no idea where I'm going tomorrow. It's snowing outside the truck right now. I can't do this. And I would pray for, pray for him to intercede somebody. And you know what? He always made a way. He always, something would happen. I'd say, oop, that's from God. You know, and sometimes he only speaks to you. Things that will happen that only you will pick up on. Only thoughts you've prayed to him, something will happen. And only you will see a result from that prayer being answered. And that's God letting you know, hey, I'm listening. I'm tuned into you. He's tuned into every one of us. He may not always answer in our time, you know, but he does answer. He does it in his time. And uh, God can for, if God can forgive us for all the awful things we've done, then surely we can forgive others for what they've done. And when it comes to the battle of temptations, you know, God doesn't simply have us pray about it. He wants us to take action. 
The great thing about Scripture is the fact that it always act, it's always active, particularly when it comes to the struggles of temptation. God calls for us to put up a fight. You know, in Romans chapter 8, verse 13, he says, put to death the misdeeds of the body by the power of the Spirit. Well, you say, well, how do I do that? How do I fight spiritual battles? How, how, can, I, how can I battle something I can't even see? You know, well, the Holy Spirit gives us some wonderful tools. The Lord gave us some wonderful tools. In Ephesians, I want to read this to y'all. It's called the armor of God. Some of y'all may know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all may never heard of it before. I really delved into it when I was preparing this sermon because I had heard it, but I really hadn't delved into what the actual armor of God was and what each piece, what the... Uh, what the function was of each piece of this armor is based off of a Roman soldier's uh, battle uniform. And this is really wonderful. In Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to go through verse 10 through 18. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And that's what all these things are, temptations, problems. They're all the devil's schemes. They're all trying to rob us of our joy of salvation. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We know the devil's not, not caged up yet. He's, he cut, he's turned loose right now. You always see the cartoons and the movies, and it shows, you know, like... The far side cartoons always shows the devils in hell with a pitchfork, putting the people driving the slow lane in the special room just for them, you know. That's funny and, 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 and all, but the devil's not chained up. He's, he's loose. He's not running around, and people don't realize that. He will be. He will be bound one day. We, we've, we know how the book ends. He will be, but right now he's still running loose. Therefore, Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith and with all you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions and with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Now, let's look at each piece of this armor because each one has its own function and they all work together to equip us to battle temptation attacks from the devil anything comes at you this is what you refer to number one let's look at the belt of truth a soldier is only ready for battle when he is girded with his belt a Roman soldier's belt was made of thick and heavy leather and had a carrying place for a sword. And the whole suit of this armor, the whole, the whole part of the, of the armor he wore was all attached to this belt. If he didn't have his belt on, none of the other parts would really stay on during battle. And they call it the belt of truth. You've got to have the truth, the truth of God's word, the truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, belief in that truth. You have that, that's going to be the foundation for every other piece of armor that you're going to have for your battles. And in uh, John 14, 16, it says, we, we must know the truth in order to protect ourselves against our flesh, the world, and the father of lies. Truth grounds us and reminds us of our identity in Christ. Truth is the belt that holds the believer's armor together through the battle. And then the second part, the breastplate of righteousness. The Roman soldier was always equipped with a breastplate. This piece of armor protected his vital organs in the heat of battle when he wasn't quick enough to take up his shield. The breastplate was for a quick 
and unexpected advances of the enemy. Who here has had quick and unexpected advances from the enemy before? I have them daily. I have them daily, y'all. Uh, my brother-in-law, Mandy's youngest brother, he said something years ago, and it stuck with me. We were talking about this, and especially when I was starting to understand salvation and, and really wanting to get to know Christ. He helped me a lot, and, and he told me, he said, I said, I said you know, Kevin, I'm, I'm not going to be perfect. <laughs> I'm not, man. I'm going to mess up every day. And he said, Mikey, I die in my sin every day. I die every day. And what he said really struck me because this is a guy that when I met my wife, you know, Kevin was a believer, and I've admired his relationship with Christ. Even before I came to Christ, I admired this guy. He believes what he's talking about, you know, and it made me excited. But just the fact that hearing him, as high of a pedestal as I put him, he struggles too. I'd have thought this cat has it figured out. He's, he's not going to have any problems. And when he said, I die every day in my sin, I was like, so you still fight? He said, I fight every day, man. But you fight with Jesus on your side. You're on the winning side. You have the spiritual tools you need to defeat. But you will go to battle. And it just really struck me that, wow, this guy needs God every day. I figure he's got it together, but he's just like me. I'm just now getting into this. I realize how much I need God. He's been in this for a long time. Every day he still needs God. That gave me hope. That gave me hope of I'm on the right path, you know. But, the, but those, uh, quick and, uh, those quick and unexpected advances, they happen. They're all the time. As believers, we have no righteousness apart from what has been given to us by Christ. Like I said, we can't save ourselves. Our, our deeds, you know, I can, I can go by and go through the drive through and McDonald's and, hey, pay for the car behind me. Thanks. I'll feel good. That's a good deed. But things like that, things we do for people, gifts we give, all that, he says, in the eyes of the Lord are as dirty rags, filthy rags. I mean, the real righteousness we can only get through Christ, through his forgiveness. And he, he wants us to be good to each other. Don't get me wrong, he, he likes that. But when it comes to salvation, the deeds won't get you there. Doing good, thinking good, being a good person, I'm sure it doesn't hurt. But belief in Jesus is the only thing that gets you there. At the end of the, at the, end of the day, at the, your last breath, as long as you believe that Jesus was the Son of God, he rose out of that, he paid for our debts, and he rose out of that tomb three days later. That's what has to go on in your mind. Not how, how much you did while you were here, or how many people you helped, or what a good person you were. It doesn't say anywhere in the Bible that, that that really holds a lot of weight. You know, it's good. It's good to help everybody, good to help your fellow man, but you've got to have that relationship. And uh, back to what I was talking about here. As believers, you have no righteousness apart from which has been given by Christ. Our, bless, our bless, uh, breastplate is his righteousness. His righteousness will never fail. Though we have no righteousness of our own, we must still, by his power, choose to do right. Living a right life rooted in God's word is powerful in protecting our hearts and defeating the enemy. And say, well, you know, how can we use the breastplate of righteousness? What's some, what's some examples? Well, for each of us, this is going to be unique. You know, this is where you look at things you do that you might need to change. You know, for me, it was watching TVs and watching movies and things that uh, I realized I really don't, this really bothers me. It's not bothering me, this content I'm watching. Yeah, it's just a show. But then after a while, I was like, this is wrong. This is not, this is not what, a, what a, I would think God would want me to watch and, and be involved in. So for every person, it's going to be different. But there's going to be little changes in you. When God is, uh, is giving his righteousness to you, you're going to feel little changes. You're going to feel things that are going to want to shift, and that's okay. That's the Holy Spirit guiding you into his righteousness. And then number three, the sandals, the gospel of peace. Roman soldiers' feet were fitted with sandals 
These sandals were made to help protect the soldiers' feet during their long marches into battle. They had extremely thick soles and wrapped perfectly around the ankles in a way that protected from blistering. Because they had to travel to fight those battles, they had to have real good shoes. Because you can imagine how the terrain was back then. Dirt, rocks, sand, scorpions, all kind of good stuff. You're going to step on bare feet. You're going to need some good shoes. They had good shoes. And that's where they take the gospel of. The gospel is a good foundation for you to have all the rest of your armor of God pieces carried on top of. If you've got the gospel, if you know the story of Jesus, believers also have a firm foundation of the gospel. As believers, we have peace in knowing we are secure in what Jesus has done for us. That goes back to that, to that belief that Jesus died for us, that he is the son of God, that he did save us. And all we have to do is believe and love him, follow his, follow his will. There's no, part or, there's no hat tricks, there's no part or tricks it's a relationship with a friend. That's all it is. Remind yourself of the hope you have in Jesus Christ because of his sacrifice and your belief in him. You shall not perish but have eternal life. Think about that. We're all going to be at death's door one day, physical death. There's no way around it. But when you have a relationship with Jesus, you know it's fixing to get real good. All the problems are going to be over. I'm going to be with the person, the, the being that loves me more than anyone else. Now, it's not that way for someone who doesn't believe. That's why we need to pray for the unlost. That's why we need to take, if we can steer somebody in that direction. If we meet somebody that doesn't understand, I don't get that whole Christian thing. I don't, I, yeah, you guys are nice, but no thanks, but no thanks. Find out why they feel that way. They may have been told some wild stories. They may have have a total misconception of what it means to be a follower of Christ. I know I did. Oh, people tried to talk to me for years. I just, eh, thanks, okay, yeah, I'll call you. I didn't want to hear it because in my mind I'd made it up. Same way with someone you might run across. Maybe they don't know. Maybe they just have the wrong, wrong conception of how things work. You could be the one to turn that person around, to make sure they don't burn for eternity because of something you said in love and kindness. Well, think about this. This is what we believe. Jesus, the Son of God, he died for your sins. It's a free gift. He sent his son because he loves you. Just those few little words right there, you never know how that's going to affect someone because when you plant that seed like that little small seed, God takes that, and you don't know what else God is having come at them that could take that little seed as fuel for other things that God is showing them during their life. Maybe not that week, but during their whole existence. You never know. My dad, God rest his soul, 82 years old, Alabama, uh, Arkansas hillbilly, he was. That man was as hard as a piece of concrete up till a week before he died. And I had tried, tried my best to bring him to salvation. But I'm his little boy. Yeah, I'm 47, but I'm his little boy to him. Wouldn't listen to me. Got a call. And some of you got to meet my dad when he came to live with us for a little while before he passed away. I said, a hard man. I'm not lying. I, I take after my mom, thankfully. I, I like happiness. Dad just tell you straight up how it is and let you have it. That's just how he was. But uh, I got a call from my sister Friday morning. Dad's passed away. Dad's gone. Well, I had my cry pulled over. I was on the way to work. Pulled over, cried, went on to the, to the home there. and Because I was thinking, Dad was lost. He wouldn't listen. Dad was lost. You know, I hate that he, I tried, I almost spoon-fed him the Bible. And he would just say, well, son, I hope so. I said, no, Dad, you have to know. You're saying, well, I hope I am. No, Dad, you're not getting it, you know. I get to, the, I get to the, the home that he was staying at, and I walk in, and he's laying there on the bed. His body is, and there's the uh, pastor there in the room. And he said, let me introduce myself. I can't remember the pastor's name. It was kind of an emotional moment there, and I shook, my hand, shook his hand, introduced myself, and, and uh, I said, uh, you know, I just hate that, that I wasn't able to bring him to Christ. 
And he just smiled. He said, well, your father came to Christ three days ago. I said, he did? He said, yes, yes. I was in here talking to him one day, and, and I revealed the gospel to him. And, and you know, he had said that you had tried to talk to him about this, and he just didn't understand. And I laid it out for him as simply as I could. And as best to my knowledge, Mr. Booth, your father accepted Christ right there in that room. I didn't know it. It took somebody, and it took him 72 hours before he crossed over, a whole life lived. But the last inning of the game, man, he slid into home. That's what matters. So if you're here and you don't know, and you're thinking, well, it's too late for me, I'm too old, I've done too much, there's no way that this Jesus guy can save me, it's never too late. It is never too late. He is sitting there just waiting. I know y'all have heard this before. There's a picture that uh, I've seen of Jesus. It's, it's, it's a picture. No, I'm kidding. I ain't seen pictures of Jesus. I ain't that old. I know I messed up. Uh, there's, a, there's a painting of Jesus, and I love it. It has him in a garden. I know it's not right here, but y'all can just imagine. It has this garden with this house and a door. And Jesus is there, and he's like this right here on the door. Y'all ever seen that, that, that painting? If you'll notice, there isn't a doorknob on the outside of the door. Jesus will never force his way in. He will never grab the handle and force his way in your heart, but he's always right there wanting to come in. Let him in. It'll be the best decision you've ever made. You'll feel the most love you've ever felt if you let him into your heart. And you give up your freedom to submit to the freedom of service in Christ. It'll be the best decision you've ever made in this life and in eternity. So let's go over these real quick. We're almost done. I'm going to wrap it up here in just a second. I could talk all day. Number four, the shield of faith. This is very important. The Roman shield was a complex piece of armor. The shield also uh, was a, their primary defense weapon. It was made of impenetrable wood, leather. It could be doused in, in, in water if uh, they caught some flaming arrows from the enemies. They used to cheat and light the arrows on fire and shoot them at people. That's cheating, I think. But uh, the faith is the shield of the believer. Trusting God's power and protection is imperative in remaining steadfast. When the battle rages, we must remember that God, that God works all things for good because there's going to be battles where we think on the outside it looks like we're losing. God's forsaken me. God's not helping me right now. God's letting me fall. He's letting my family be sick. He's letting my finances go down the tube. Where's he at? God's there. God's there. And if there's something bad happening, He's working it around for a good. He's working around for his glory. Be thankful that he has chosen to reveal his glory in you. It's a great honor. Then you've got the helmet of salvation. The soldier's head was one of the most vulnerable areas without his helmet. One blow to the head could prove fatal. Game over. His helmet covered his entire head facial area between the eyes the armor would prove useless if it wasn't equipped with a helmet I mean what good is it going to do you go in the fight you got your breastplate and your belt on and your sandals and they hit you in the head wouldn't it be a real short fight wouldn't it It'd be kind of over kind of quick the believer's helmet of salvation is one of the most crucial pieces of armor for the Christian without the indwelling Holy Spirit that enters a believer at the moment of salvation all other armor is useless Salvation empowers believers to fight. It protects us in our weakness. Without salvation, you can't have victory. Victory over death, victory over the enemy. It's just not possible. And you've got number six, the sword of the Spirit. I love the sword because the sword is, is the only one that is not a defensive weapon. All other pieces of the so, of soldier arsenal are defensive weapon, but not this sword. The sword, which is his word, the Bible, in the hands of a skilled warrior, he could pierce through even the strongest of armor. Our sword is the word of God, both the written and the incarnate word. Every other piece of armor protects us against attacks, 
But with God's word, we are truly able to fight and defeat all enemies. Christ used scripture to defeat Satan when he was tempted in, in the desert. It's, it, it's, it's uh, the only attack weapon we have. And it's the best one. Nothing trumps the word of God. And number seven, the last one is prayer. In prayer, we show our reliance upon God to act and move. Our entire armor is rooted in his strength. Without his presence, we're powerless in the fight. We must fight on our knees. The one who has won the war is with us in battle. We will see a victory when we fight in his power. And sometimes prayer, sometimes prayer is more for us to, you know, we, we ask God to do things like with me, you know, I, I asked God to heal my father. Didn't happen, you know, and I understand that, that uh, God does what God does. God's, 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 uh, I went blank. God does what he wants. It's not for me to tell him what, what to do. But prayer allowed me to understand God's will. It allowed me to be at peace with his decisions. Sometimes prayer isn't for something we want, but prayer is for understanding of God's choices. And sometimes we don't get that understanding. We will one day. But sometimes things happen that we're not supposed to understand and that don't make sense to us. But in the grand scheme of everything, it works out to God's glory. We know that because it tells us that in his word. So when you go into, a, when you go into battle and you start thinking about uh, independence and doing what you want to and you're having those battles every day of uh, what you want versus what you know is right, what you know isn't right, you can always put on that armor of God and it will steer you the way you need to go. If you listen to his word, Believe what he says. Trust his decisions. Trust his actions. And always be in prayer to him. He'll always be there for you. Uh, if you would stand, I've never closed out a service, so uh, if you'd like to come up to the front here for a minute, I want to do like a little song kind of like I normally do. If you want to come up to the front and pray, or you can just pray at your seat, however you want to do it. Like I said, this is the first time for me to close out a service, so I'm, I'm probably forgetting something, but uh, do a little song. If you want to come up front, come on up front. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. Uh, uh, one more announcement. Youth right now on Wednesday nights, we've suspended youth for the time being right now. We've got some issues we've got to work out. And uh, once we get those worked out, we'll be right back with the youth program. But for a couple weeks at least, we're going to be suspending youth on Wednesday nights. So uh, we'll get with Byron on that and get all the, uh, all the logistics worked out. And I uh, just want to say thank you all for being here. I hope you all got something out of this. Uh, I know I did. I was terrified the whole time. I'm still pretty scared. It's hard to, it's hard to do this. Uh, but uh, I was honored that Pastor Byron asked me to, and I hope it made sense. I hope you got something out of it. I hope that maybe you can run into somebody. God's going to put somebody in your path today or this week, and maybe something I said will trigger something, and you can help lead that person to Christ. Wouldn't it be great to walk into heaven and see someone? That guy, that lady right there, she helped me. That's one of the reasons I'm here. Wouldn't that feel great to know that you helped someone get there?
no better feeling, y'all. Anyway, uh, if you would, just uh, be good to each other and uh, see y'all next Sunday. Uh, Royce, would you dismiss us, please?